Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Deacon, and welcome to this Reuters events webinar, Our Tankers on the Road to Recovery, in partnership with Kepler. Without further delay, I'm going to hand over to our moderator, Paul Chapman, managing partner, Human Capital, a search and talent advisory firm focused on the commodities markets, and also the host of the HC Insider podcast. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Nick. Um, looking forward to this discussion on the, the tanker market is on the road to recovery. Um, after a challenging 2020 and a challenging start to the uh, beginning of 2021. And before I introduce the, the panelists, I'd just like to say that we're inviting questions uh, in the chat. So to please do post those and we'll try to get to them. Um, so thank you to our panelists. First, we've got Peter Sand, Chief Shipping Analyst at BIMCO, Richard Matthews, Director of Consultancy and Research at Gibson, a shipbroker, and finally, Matt Wright, Senior Freight Analyst at Kepler, a uh, data analytics company focused on facilitating global trade. Um, to tee us up and give us an overview of what's gone on in the first half of the year, uh, Matt's prepared a, a couple of slides for us just with the data and some insights on the market for the first half of 2021. So over to you, Matt. Thanks, Paul. Just wait for those uh, slides to come up. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, I just thought to kick off the discussion, it would be useful to um, look over a couple of charts um, that we can use to then uh, talk around um, a bit later on. So starting on, moving on to the first slide, um, looking at demand to, to start with and China specifically, which is so often the barometer for the crude tanker market. So as we know, crude inventories uh, built very steeply last year and this year they have been um, declining but there is still quite a way to go. So even with um, generally lower imports, especially in the last couple of months, inventories have been very, very sensitive to any short-term increase in imports. Um, even you know, the last couple of months when imports have been well below uh, you know, 10 million barrels a, um, a day, we've seen builds in stocks. So the point here that I really wanted to make was you know, as a platform for the second half of the year and looking ahead to next year, it's not necessarily a great position to be in. We've not seen a huge drawdown. You know, we can we can talk a bit about why that has around high levels of refinery maintenance, et cetera. But um, even with imports of relatively low levels, stocks um, have been rising. And even recently, we've seen a, a stock build over the last couple of weeks. Um, OK, then we'll uh, yeah, move on to the next one. So now on the supply side, so this is more of a summary view of um, our view for the next um, six months and moving into next year. So um, average increases this year have been relatively modest, you know, starting in January when OPEC plus delayed the first, the, the most recent um, reduction in cuts. And while average increases the year are projected to be around 2.8 million barrels a day, by the end of the year, we expect output to be up significantly. So here it's a bit more of a positive picture potentially where the output, you know, with OPEC finally coming to, to an agreement the other week um, with 400,000 um, barrels a day coming online every month now through to December, we should start to see a lot more crude actually making its way to the market. Um, you know, whether all of this is, makes it directly into exports is to be seen. I think maybe over the summer we'll have some issues. We can talk about that in terms of direct crude burn in, in the Middle East. So while you know, you're looking at the, the dark blue bar, average for the years is not the most exciting number, towards the end of the year, the actual loading should be a decent amount higher than where we currently are. And, and then looking ahead to next year again, um, you know, some further increases in, and, and a higher average for the year, which is definitely what the you know, crude tanker um, market needs. Um, OPEC will obviously be the main uh, contributed to this and you would and with oil price at where it stands there's going to be you know some increase in shale growth but we'll, we'll come on to why it's not necessarily going to be as 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 high as it could have been or would have been a couple of years ago okay moving on so now turning to the clean sorry go back one slide we just jumped ahead there so just uh, looking at clean and here, just starting with the MRs, which account for you know, well over 50% of, of clean product flows. So here, what I wanted to show here is this is the split of the MR fleet east and west of Suez. 
And as you can see, you know, prior to the pandemic, there's a fairly balanced split with the number of MRs trading east of Suez increasing steadily in line with, with greater demand in the region, which makes sense. And then we hit the pandemic and there's a huge amount of volatility. Um, we've got um, you know, collapse in demand, so loadings, and then we've got spikes in, in demand for floating storage. And now we're sort of set, we were setting back into a period earlier this year where east of Suez numbers were rising again in line with higher demand in the region. But in the last couple of months, we've started to see this reverse. Um, and, and what I wanted to highlight here was the fact that actually the Atlantic Basin is proving to be a bit of a stronger market now for MRs, um, which is contrary to, I think, expectations earlier in the year. Um, and, and, you know, this could be a point we talk about a bit is, is whether higher vaccination rates and, you know, the, the goal of zero COVID in some Asian countries is actually working against, against them um, from an oil demand point of view and then for the, for the clean tankers. Um, yeah, moving on to the next one. So here we're looking now at the long haul flows and it's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, you know, generally, you know, west to east naphtha flows have been very strong, um, you know, starting the year with the return of some South Korean crackers. Um, imports of naphtha into Asia Pacific are now well above 2019 levels. But then on the flip side, the east to west has been slower to recover with volumes still falling on some routes. European gas oil imports, um, you know, hit 2.5 million barrels per day in June, um, which is, you know, around the 2019 average. But most of this has been sourced from the Mediterranean and Russia on MRs. And so, the, you know, the long haul routes from the Middle East um, and Asia are not getting, um, you know, on LRs are not seeing the benefit. So, bit of a, so it's a bit of a mixed picture. While we're starting to see the, the recovery in volumes, the, the, the LRs aren't seeing it all, all there. So that was it. I didn't want to go into too much detail. Um, just a couple of slides to sort of kick things off. Th thanks very much, Matt. <clears throat> There's a lot to unpack there. Um, the first thing, I, you finished there talking about this shift from east to west, particularly of, of the MRs. Um, Richard, can you give us uh, your take on that? What's behind that? There's, what factors are driving that? <clears throat> Sure. I mean, you know, if you look over the sort of trends of the last few years, we've seen more refining capacity being gradually added um, east of Suez, and we've seen rationalisation taking place in west of Suez. So over a gradual period, tanker owners have been shifting more of their tonnage to the eastern hemisphere where demand has been strongest. But then if we come back into this year and we look at the pandemic and the effect of the pandemic, we can see that actually there's been a change in dynamic, where at the moment we're seeing much higher vaccination rates in the west, particularly if you look at the US, for example, which is a very important market for MR tankers. We've seen very high vaccination rates. Um, we've seen a massive reduction in lockdown measures, and we've seen high mobility there. And of course, that's been stimulating trade into the US and also trade not so much out of the US, but at the same time um, will eventually stimulate their export trade as well. And again, Europe is now performing much better. So generally, the Western Hemisphere has been performing um, more favorably for product tankers. If you look at the East, as Matt said during his presentation, you know, they're very much pursuing a different strategy of much lower caseloads and are behind on the vaccination program. So I think it's a short term distortion. I think over time, um, we all know that the demand growth is likely to be stronger east of Suez, but that will depend on these vaccination rates increasing. So short term distortion, tankers move around the world and they'll effectively move back to the market that pays the higher freight rates in the future. And that will likely be both east and west, but there has to be some balance between the two. Thanks. Um, Peter, what did you see in that presentation that you think is not, not just a short-term distortion, but a long-term trend manifesting in the, uh, the first half of 21? I think the starting point for, uh, for many uh, discussions in uh, the uh, shipping market is always that of freight rates. Uh, so I guess um, allow me to, to pinpoint uh, the one thing that, uh, that Matthew uh, may uh, not directly uh, pinpoint, uh, the fact that uh, the tanker freight rates have more or less been loss making for, for the past year uh, also, uh, since that uh, OPEC plus price war was, uh, was delivering a huge spike in demand. And that's basically also what we are about to see now unwinding if we fast forward to today and, and the immediate uh, future. Uh, that demand that was pushed forward last year, 
is of course demand that we will not see repeat itself because that was also like uh, uh, what we uh, what we saw uh, shown by uh, math uh, graphics in terms of uh, Chinese uh, crude oil stocks uh, still being elevated. And obviously there's always a question about whether these are strategic petroleum reserves or whether they are somewhat uh, an indicator of, uh, of, a, of a growing demand fundamentally where they have a certain requirement in order to, uh, to make sure that the uh, refinery throughput runs uh, can, uh, can get whatever they, they need constantly. So, uh, so I guess um, my, uh, the one thing that, that I touch on is, uh, is when will we see uh, freight rates uh, become somewhat better than they are uh, today where uh, time charter rates are also only for MRs uh, at break even levels. Uh, so if we are seeing any uh, MR uh, time charter deals done right now, they are not profitable at all. They basically cover the costs uh, and we see no uh, time charters for, for that mm. of crude oil VLCCs uh, because the indications are that, that no one is, uh, is uh, is in, in, in rush to, uh, to move any cargo soon. We basically see uh, the indications from, from brokers, maybe Richard can, uh, can add a bit on, on, on top of that. Uh, the one year time charters for VLCC is in loss making territory for, for, for new designs, uh, even with a scrubber on board. Uh, so, um, so, so those are some of the things that, that, that I take note of in, in the current market and, and the road to recovery, which is uh, absolutely still uh, ahead of us, Paul. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I want to come on to the, the outlook for the next six months, but staying on the previous six, um, you noted there about the, you know, the, <clears throat> these are loss making uh, 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 rates for right across the board. One of the things that did come out of the first half of the year was that um, many new builds, Series Max and VLCCs have ended up taking clean product. Um, what, what's behind that? I, mean, I assume that figures into this weak demand on the crude side and some of the trends you've been talking about long haul uh, products. Matt, did any of you have any insight on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, carrying clean on, on new build crude has is, is, is always happened. I think it, it's happening a little bit more than usual. And there's a couple of different flows and things that are happening, which is really is eating into the clean tanker market. So We've seen um, new builds, you know, loading clean, but they're not necessarily loading clean in East Asia. That they're, they're, they're actually going to India or the Middle East and picking up a cargo. So they could easily load crude. Um, you know, it's not to, to re necessarily reduce the ballast. And then there, um, you know, we've got we've seen a big spike in them in VLs and Suez Max is actually heading to West Africa, lightering off um, Togo, and, and then so you know, and then ship to ship on LRs and MRs into you know South America. And this has definitely been eating into a lot of MR and LR trade in, the, in, in particularly LR trade that would otherwise have come on, come from the Middle East and, and India. Um, it's definitely opportunistic um, because of the low, because of the weak crude market. Um, but, but like, as I said, you know, um, clean products loading on crude new builds is, is not necessarily a new thing. It's just, we're seeing more of it. Yeah, probably just part of those distortions that you mentioned. Um, obviously, a key factor in depressing rates, or not necessarily obviously, but a key factor in depressing rates is jet demand in the first half of the year and previously. Richard, can you walk us through the jet story? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we look at overall clean product tanker demand, a, a clean product tanker owner doesn't care if it's jet or gasoline or diesel. It doesn't really phase them as such. But of course, jet is an important part of the overall global demand puzzle. And when we look at seaborne flows, and actually Kepler data will confirm this, you can see that flows of um, gasoline, diesel, those kind of products are close to where they were pre-pandemic, so recovering quite nicely. But jet fuel is that missing piece of the puzzle. And when you look at overall ton mile demand for um, tankers, jet can be much more of a long haul product. So we see a lot of jet loading out of the Middle East coming into Europe. And likewise, we sometimes see jet coming out of Asia heading into the Atlantic Basin as well. So those are long haul flows and they create a lot of ton mile demand. And those are not missing entirely from the market at the moment. We're still seeing those flows. Um, we've been doing some more shipments recently because we are seeing an increase in aviation um, in Europe at the moment. But it's, again, it's still not back to where it was pre-pandemic. And until we have that, all that is compensated by something else, we are gonna see a product tanker market that fundamentally underperforms. Um, so the question is, when is jet demand going to be back to pre-pandemic levels? Well, it's not this year. We know that. Is it next year? Again, most analysts would probably call it being a bit further beyond that horizon. So 
it's definitely a um, headwind that the sector has to face right now. Yeah, and I will, again, we'll come on to the, uh, I think, you know, <laughs> when, when do we get back to the pre-pandemic levels across the board is going to be a, an interesting question. Um, just before we get there, one final one. Peter, one of the sort of the, um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, anomalies of the past six months has been typically with such high steel, scrap steel prices and this type of market, you see a significant amount of scrapping of, of, of all the vessels. We haven't seen that. What's your, your thesis behind that? Well, uh, Paul, for, uh, for, for more than a year now, we have basically warned the, the tanker shipping industry that they should not expect a flurry of ships to get, uh, get scrapped. Uh, and in order for, for that to, to ease uh, the, uh, the balance, which is clearly off in the market right now with, uh, with uh, way too many tankers chasing too few cargoes. And the reason for that being, well, as you rightly mentioned, there is a, there is a multi-year high scrap steel prices uh, right now. So, uh, so uh, it, it easily pops the question, should owners not take advantage of, uh, of these high markets? But, but then again, if there is uh, someone out there in the market offering, uh, well, two to five million dollars in excess of that, uh, those ships are traded in the secondhand market instead. So we have actually seen quite a busy secondhand market. And that has been fueled not by uh, necessarily uh, investors and, and owners uh, anticipating a swift recovery, but the fact that uh, that some of that monetary expansion that we have seen on a global scale have basically inflated a lot, uh, also in terms of asset uh, prices, not only the stock market and, and uh, iron ore futures, uh, but surely also that of, uh, of, of shipping assets. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons behind uh, only uh, a limited uh, extent of, of demolition. And in some of the records that we tend to follow, we see uh, only eight, uh, and that's uh, four uh, trading VLCCs and, and four VLCCs that, that used to do floating storage only. Uh, so it's an insignificant amount of, uh, of, of tonnage that has, uh, has left the, uh, the crude oil tanker uh, sector. It's, uh, it's slightly better off in the, the oil product sector, where we have seen something around 2 million uh, debt weight on being, uh, being taken out of the market uh, so far. But it's, it's not the flurry that, uh, that, that many of those uh, bullish pundits uh, were, were hoping for uh, one, uh, one year ago. And it, it all arises, of course, from the fact that, uh, that um, 2020, despite the uh, devastating second half of it, the first half of it delivered, uh, well, spectacular earnings, in particular, of course, in the second uh, uh, quarter with, uh, with spot earnings uh, for, for, for many uh, crude oil sectors in excess of $100,000 a day. So you may lose some $10,000 a day on average now in, in the markets, but at that point in time, you made, uh, well, almost 100 extra profits every single day. So that, of course, have, uh, have uh, built war chests for, for those uh, owners and investors. And, and that's holding back that, uh, that balancing of the market. And of course, also in the end, extending the, uh, the road to recovery in the end, when we look ahead to, uh, to uh, what we are hopefully at some point in time seeing in terms of a, a tanker shipping market, which will exceed that of uh, the, the pre-pandemic levels. <laughs> Yeah, so you, there's that global commodity super cycle and an inflation in there. And there is that floating storage of last year um, that, that made these outsized returns for, uh, for, the, for the owners. It seems like that, Matt, from your presentation, you know, floating storage is also winding down though. So it, uh, people aren't necessarily expecting that, those trade opportunities to return, as I see it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... Yeah, I mean that, that that chart was was onshore storage in China, but floating storage for sure is down. You know, it was um from the peak last year. We're way way down, but we're sort of you know it was up around two hundred million barrels at the peak in June, and it's now down. I think around you know mid you know seventies to eighties, but we are still slightly above pre pandemic of around fifty. So there's there's still vessels tied up, but you know they are not. It's not providing a crutch to the market that it was last year. You know, last year when you had these vessels tied up. Um, particularly the VLCCs, when, um, you know, after that spike uh, that Peter was talking about, rates rates did come off quite sharply because there was such a drop in, in demand um, and, and the OPEC cut, obviously, on the supply side from the OPEC cuts. But a huge number of vessels tied up did sort of support the market to an extent. The difference that we're seeing the first half of this year is those vessels have left floating storage. They're back trading in the market. 
and we still have low output and we still have low demand. And that is why we're seeing these you know, negative earnings across the sectors. Excellent. And just staying on this, this scrapping story, I think it is interesting. Um, I know that uh, Richard Gibson put out a, a slightly, uh, well, another viewpoint, which was that many of these vessels are being kept on to, to service um, uh, Venezuela and Iran hit by sanctions. Is, is that a supportable story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if we go back to scrapping, in our view, we're like, look, all of the drives of scrapping are great. You've got close to a record high scrap price. You've got plenty of old ships. You've got a terrible market. So, you know, generally all of the trades are loss making right now. So, you know, why wouldn't you scrap? And also, if you look going forwards, again, we've got a lot of regulation coming in that will make it older for the harder for these older vessels to to trade. So the drivers are very supportive. But as Peter said, you know, you've got a VLCC that scrap value might be twenty one, twenty two million dollars. But there's someone out there willing to pay you maybe twenty five, twenty six million dollars who wants to carry on trading that ship. Now, um, you know, I'm always pretty suspicious anyway, but we've been following these vessels after the sales have taken place. And it's amazing how many of these vessels sail towards the Middle East or into the Atlantic heading across the Caribbean and suddenly their transponders go off. And you think, hmm, what are they doing? You know, sailing towards the Caribbean, you wouldn't turn your transponder off in that part of the world unless there was something um, that you were trying to hide. And then as time goes by, we typically see these vessels turning up in other parts of the world. Um, we pick up them from other sources and we can see they've been doing that Venezuelan or Iranian crude. And, you know, that doesn't need to be a long term play. You've only got to do, you know, maybe six months a year of this Venezuelan or Iranian business. And then you've made enough money to pay the ship off and then you can sell it for scrap anyway. You know, the, the freight rates being offered for this illicit trade, um, we understand to be, you know, 10 times the, the current market. So it's pretty attractive for those people who want to do it. Um, but of course, it's not a lot. There's not much longevity in it. And if sanctions do get lifted, then these vessels will get marginalised from the market and most likely scrapped. Still at a, a decent price. Um, that that teases up nicely to look at the the next six months and where uh, is there a, a potential recovery for the tanker market? There's lots of stories there, obviously driven ultimately by COVID. Um, what are the Chinese going to do? There's the jet demand. There's um, there's also the the sanctions coming off Iran and so forth. Um, Peter, perhaps you can uh, start us off with, uh, you know, just a, a global macro view of, of what you see for the next six months and some of the themes we can dig into. Absolutely, uh, Paul, and, and uh, taking the, uh, the helicopter view of, uh, or perhaps even from, uh, from, from orbit around the world, as uh, space traveling seems to be uh, uh, the name of this month also from, uh, from not only Musk and, and Amazon. But, uh, but looking at uh, China and India, those uh, countries that, that have driven oil demand uh, for, for, for the past couple of years and, and are also expected to do so going forward, obviously their fear for, uh, say, another wave of COVID infections uh, to, to hit them is, is putting a lid somewhat on, uh, on the demand uh, from, uh, from those uh, nations. Uh, but indeed, we need to look at uh, the Far East Asia and, and China and India for, for, for that demand. And in many ways, they are uh, very, very close to, to what we can term uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, but when we, uh, when we uh, hover around uh, Europe and, and North America, uh, we're not going to see pre-pandemic levels being breached until the end of uh, well potentially 2023 uh, giving us uh, somewhat of a global balance uh, by the end of next year uh, and i think in many ways uh, some of those uh, stories always relating to to, to covid seems to, uh, to 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 give us a uh, well a bad carry on that uh, on that uh, uh, golf ball uh, lifting off from uh, from 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 the tee uh, but uh, but but it is it is one of the things that at least we look at uh, quite in details. What are the uh, say? When do we see that global uh, demand uh, getting uh, getting back? And uh, and in terms of, uh, of of Europe and in terms of uh, North America, uh, Europe left peak oil demand a couple of years back, uh, depending on how the. Um, the Biden administration is uh, is uh, getting by its um, uh, well climate uh, climate war uh, is, is is unlikely to see uh, right now on on the horizon how that will develop. Uh, but uh, again, if if you go by by at least some of the um, the lines that are put out uh, right now, it seems as if um, uh, global oil demand could also 
have peaked in, uh, in, in North America also. And, um, and if we go to the South America, I guess that's where the, the Lambda variant is, uh, is now taking its, uh, its toll. But, but fingers crossed, I mean, South America have been battling uh, fiercely uh, COVID-19 from the very start of it. Uh, but in many ways, uh, it hasn't impacted shipping that much, uh, fortunately. Uh, fingers crossed, uh, not the, uh, the Lambda variant will not uh, change that uh, predominantly. So, so across the globe, uh, we are seeing only a steady and gradual recovery. Fingers crossed when we look forward now that uh, the winter market uh, will always uh, give us uh, some, uh, some upside in, in terms of freight rates. Uh, but uh, but I have to say that uh, if we if we look beyond uh, the, uh, the the winter market, there's still a lot of uh, uh, say room to be to be made up. And if you look at OPEC plus, uh, I think it was also pointed to uh, earlier on that, uh, that that oil production in itself is not enough. You need that to be exported. But from a tanker point of view, obviously, the more oil being produced, the more oil is also likely to be exported, and that is of course uh, good for business going forward. Yeah, I know from your own writing that you know, the, the view is that the peak demand, I think 2017 for Europe, you stated in 2019 for, for North America. So with those in the rear view mirror, it's may, very much looking at the developing nations for that future growth in demand. Um, Matt, in your presentation, you know, you, you, you alluded to the, the low vaccination rates and different strategies in, in Asia. What, do, what does the data show, if anything, about the, the next six months for, uh, for Asia demand? Yeah, so, you know, Southeast Asia, is, you know, on the clean side is a really, really important product sink, um, huge net importer of products, um, you know, that a lot of that is refined in the Middle East, in China, uh, and elsewhere. So, it, it, you know, we've seen growth in imports has slowed definitely in the last couple of months, I think January to March, we saw, you know, pretty steady growth, but it's definitely come off, you know, you've got countries like India, which are posting some of the highest numbers, your COVID numbers at the moment. Um, you know, th it is definitely a concern. And I think depending on how they come out of this, you know, the, the current Delta spike will be key and, and how they adapt their, their, their zero COVID strategy. Um, the, what it means from, from a crude, you know, I, I think starting on the, on the sort of overall crude side, I think looking at China is a key one um, because, you know, China's, China's demand is going to drive um, main crude flows and if crude flows are doing well a lot of the other tanker segments seem to follow um china's a bit of a question mark there because you know as i showed on those slides we've got um inventories are being drawn down but they're not quite down. they're not down yet there's some reason for that you know there was a lot of refinery maintenance this year so refinery runs were not where they were to, to require um you know strong levels of crude imports um so you know the next six months is going to be very interesting but, you know, just read this morning that um, a lot of independents are cutting refinery runs, have cut refinery runs in July. You know, they're expecting lower import quotas. Um, whether this means that the, you know, the state-owned refiners increase to make up for that shortfall, we'll have to wait and see. But, you know, the Chinese crude import will be a, will be a massive, will be a massive factor. You know, on the, the, the demand side is, is, is where the question marks. I think then turning to supply, I think supply is a slightly clearer picture because, you know, one of the, the blessings, you know, OPEC plus has, has mixed blessings, but, you know, when coming to an agreement last month, um, we have a view from now until the end of the year, you know, 400,000 barrels a day. That is fundamentally good news for, for tankers because assuming we don't have a huge uh, reversal in demand growth from, uh, you know, COVID issues in China or, or elsewhere, that will be most of that will make its way into the export market. I think perhaps over the summer, some of the output from the Middle East, you know, that's increase in production. Some of that increase in output may go to direct crude burn for air conditioning, et cetera. But particularly towards the end of the year, you know, we've got August, September, October, you've got a, a you know, decent, you know, we're looking at a decent rise in output growth. Most of that will go straight into exports. And that is only a good thing for, from, a, from a crude loadings point of view. And, and when the VLs start to see stronger rates, it will lift all the segments below as well. Mm. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that, very clear picture. Um, Richard, just staying, going back to um, Chinese demand, what's your take on these um, import quotas being cut and the impact on, on the teapots as they're known and, and what does that mean for, 
for especially on on product exports sure i mean <clears throat> you know we're, we're definitely looking at um weaker growth in chinese exports and imports this year for sure um it seems pretty evident the chinese government is looking to crack down on the independent sector um part of the justification behind that is to help achieve its climate goals in the future um but there may be more to it than that so from an import perspective, um, we're definitely going to see China import less blending components, um, LCO and other products they've been importing to make diesel. We're also going to see the independents now, of course, import less bitumen mix. Much of that was coming from um, Venezuela anyway. And of course, now with these lower quotas, their, their crude imports will be down as well. What they can't do, which they were doing in the past as well, was using um, the import quotas of the major state-owned companies as well to supplement where they had deficits. They do, of course, sell, potentially do, of course, have high stocks. So they could still maintain refining run rates by running down their stocks, their inventories in the short term. But again, they need export quota to push this product to market. And it doesn't look like they're going to be getting um, much of that going forward. So certainly it is a bit negative for product exports from the country. Um, as we've just spoken about, crude imports to the country are also looking um, a bit more challenged, although we do still expect to see them growing year on year. And there's another point I just want to add in general, which we haven't touched upon yet for the crude tanker sector in a whole. Um, high inventories, and when I mean inventories, I'm talking land-based inventories, are the enemy of the tanker sector. When the market's backwardated and refiners have high land-based inventories, they're less likely to take increased volumes of seaborne crude. But as the market goes through the rebalancing, as demand recovers and OPEC heat production generally below demand, those stocks are going to get drawn lower and lower and lower. And as we go forwards into next year, when demand does continue to grow, suddenly refiners are going to turn around and say, well, I don't really have much inventory, so I'm having to buy that incremental barrel from seaborne sources. And that tends to have a bigger impact on overall crude trade. So as painful as this inventory drawdown is right now for tankers, it makes the future look brighter when demand does return. Yeah, so you've got a few things pushing a positive picture. You've got obviously the OPEC plus story. You've got um, <clears throat> some of this drawdown of inventories. Um, where does uh, the, um, where does JET fit into this? I mean, is there any view to it? Does anyone have a view that JET will recover through the rest of the year or is it gonna stay depressed? And I realize that's a tough question with the Delta variant spiking across the world as we speak. Yeah, if I can uh, add a bit on that, uh, Paul, um, I think uh, all the long hauls uh, will will still be very much missing in uh, in in the world of jet fuel demand. Uh, we have seen uh, domestic flights uh, in China, in the U.S., uh, and also up and coming now in in, in Europe, uh, picking up. Uh, but it is it is all of the long hauls uh, that is uh, that is limited. Uh, the travel restrictions that uh, remain in place uh, for, uh, for 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 battling uh, COVID. Which is uh, which is uh, limiting that of, of jet fuel, but uh, but please allow me also to uh, to conclude a bit on uh, on on China and, and one of the, the long holes that we see for for VLCCs because uh, uh, Brazil uh, is, uh, is is normally one of the uh, the friends of uh, of uh, very large uh, cruise carriers so when they, when they export uh, crude oil uh, out of Brazil uh, into China, but we have also seen somewhat of a weak support from that market uh, this year. I mean, especially May uh, May exports uh, in general, but in particular to uh, to to China this year was uh, was horribly low, uh, with uh, with June somewhat uh, in a recovery mode. Uh, but if we look at the first half of the year in 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 total, uh, exports out of Brazil were were down in general, and they were quite almost ten percent down to to China uh, specifically. And obviously, when you have 10,000 nautical miles approximately from, uh, from, from Brazil to, to China, that is putting a lid on, uh, on, on tanker freight rates also. So going forward, of course, always relevant to, to, to look out for, uh, for the long haul uh, trades, uh, not only out of Brazil, but in, in particular, of course, also out of the, the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, if we are looking for the road to, uh, to recovery. Mm. Why do you, do you have any insight as to why that in Brazil in particular that that trade has dropped off? I, th I think it's, it, it puzzles me a little bit uh, what what really went on in in, in May, uh, but in, in in terms of uh, uh, overall political friendship between uh, Brazil and and China, uh, they have a, a 
long-standing relationship, but also a, a very one-sided one where there's a key leader, China uh, says jump, uh, Brazil says how high. Uh, but, uh, but I would, uh, I would uh, not necessarily call it a, a power play uh, back in uh, back in May, uh, but uh, but merely a, a matter of, uh, of timing in, in some way, and, and also uh, due to the fact that uh, I think Brazil basically peaked their imports also in in May uh, this year, exceeding more than uh, than 60 million uh, for uh, for. Um, uh, for for that month alone, uh, so so there's always a little bit of a, of, a, of six up and downs when uh, when you, when you do a, a monthly average uh, like that. I saw also in uh, the way that uh, that that Matt early on uh, presented some of his views, uh, where you have like a, a running uh, average in, instead, uh, perhaps giving more of an indication of uh, of the trend. But I don't see the the relationship being off here. Uh, but I but I definitely see that as a as a potential trigger uh, to, to look out for when uh, simply due to the fact that ships are and tonnage are tied up uh, for a much longer period of time when uh, when uh, when China exports from Brazil uh, as opposed to uh, to when China exports from uh, well from uh, from the short holes uh, of, of uh, the eastern part of Russia uh, or, or even Middle East uh, so so that's not really the juicy bells that we're looking for we need the long holes uh, we need uh, we need China also to take from North Sea. We need China to take uh, take a barrel out of Black Sea uh, in order really to to find support in the market. Yeah, thank you. And we've got a question in the uh, in in the chat from Jack Shi who asks, um, uh, where do we stand from middle to long term standpoint with naphtha supply um, versus LPG? Um, I know that, uh, <clears throat> that you touched on that in your presentation. I think Matt on the naphtha side. Could you could you talk to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, you know, Naphtha so far this year has been has been very very strong. But as Jack points out, a lot of PDH coming online. Um, I, I'm not an expert in terms of the flexibility on, on a number of these. You know, the crackers and PDH on you know crackers in particular have flexibility between LPG and, and Naphtha intake. But for sure, and, and I think a lot of fundamentally it comes down. It got, a lot of it comes down to price. You know, if one of them is is moving above the other, you're going to see some some switch back. I think um, long-term prospects are good for both. I think the pet chem sector is fundamentally where um, there's going to be the most strength in oil demand. Um, and so I think both LPG and naphtha are going uh, that's going to be a lot of refiners are going to be maximizing. Um, if the, if you, if you don't have an integrated pet chem facility, you're going to be making sure you're maximizing your naphtha cuts to, to push out to, to Asia. Um, and, and those facilities in Asia that are integrated are going to be the ones with, with the highest margins. Excellent, thank you. Um, so one of the, I guess, when you when you look towards the next six months, one of the big stories out there is Iran. Will the sanctions be lifted? If they are, that has quite a uh, there's, there's there's quite a bit of discussion about what the impact would be, and it's not necessarily clear on the tanker market. Um, Richard, could you uh, could you start us off on that subject and and give us your the the highlights of what you think would happen if if those yeah, sanctions? Yeah, I, I could probably talk about for about half an hour about this, but I'll try and keep it too. <laughs> So one or two minutes, but no, I mean, look, fundamentally more oil in the market is, is good for tankers and that's what we want to see. Um, the question I always have is, well, would we rather that oil come from somewhere else? Um, and that's nothing against the Iranians, but as Peter was just saying, I'd much rather see that crude coming out the US Gulf, heading into China and heading into Asia than I would coming out of the Middle East, just because of the ton mile effect of that. But we still believe that Iran coming back is marginally positive for the sector marginally positive because we'll have more oil for start um, but also as we touched upon earlier there's a lot of very old vessels trading Iranian oil and they're only able to do that right now because there's no um, modern vessels willing to do it so therefore they have that sort of captive market that illicit market as, as we like to call it and for the VLCC fleet that's about 10 percent and I think for the Suez Max fleet it's about seven percent of the fleet is engaged in either Iranian or Venezuelan trade now, if sanctions get lifted, those vessels will not be acceptable to the buyers of Iranian oil. And when I'm talking about the buyers, I'm talking about the companies that um, currently don't buy it and only buy it if sanctions were lifted. So those vessels will very quickly get marginalized and taken out of the fleet and probably end up being scrapping. So it's beneficial from a tanker supply perspective. Um, not all of them will be scrapped. Uh, we have to remember that the National Iranian Tanker Company has about 40 VLCCs, and most of those will probably stay trading and will deliver crude. On FOB contracts, but most charterers or most traders who buy Iranian oil will probably want to buy it um, effectively FOB, and therefore they'll use their own ships. So 
it's going to take some old tonnage out of the market. It's going to bring more oil into the market. Um, of course, you have to balance that and say, well, if Iran is pumping more, then it probably limits the ability of the rest of OPEC to increase production. But we still think it's marginally positive overall for the market. Um, whether it will happen or not, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. We have a new president in Iran, of course. Um, talks with the US are yet to resume. We understand that will take place in August. So there's still a lot of uncertainty around it. I think it's taken longer than people expected, um, but eventually we think it will probably happen. Mm. So potentially, you know, um, a, a, a net positive. Um, uh, Peter, do you, what's your take on, on, on Richard's comments? When I um, try to get my head around these uh, political aspects of, uh, of, of tanker shipping, I always get excited because that is often what delivers the freight rate spikes, uh, but mostly when, uh, when sanctions are invoked, not when they are lifted. Uh, so, uh, so getting back to the talks in, in Vienna, uh, normally when we hear very little about uh, the, the, the talks, it's positive because then diplomacy basically finds its, its way to, to work. And from a, from a say, um, uh, an economical perspective and from a, from, a, from a perspective of humanity, I think it would be great if, if uh, the JCPOA uh, would, would be reinstated in, in some way. Uh, but but I, to be honest, I don't see it happening. Uh, the, uh, the new uh, leadership uh, in, in Iran uh, hasn't changed uh, a bit in, in terms of the fact that, uh, that the, the supreme leader remains the same. He is indeed a hardliner, uh, and uh, and it's unlikely uh, that uh, that they're going to, uh, to 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 bow into to any any deal. Uh, they would like to, uh, to. I mean, the Iranians would love to see the upsides from a lifting of sanctions, but they they hate to give in to anything. And we have seen through many years of, of economic uh, well decline in, in in Iran that that is not something that that that, that they put much emphasis on. Uh, so so the the well. I think uh, I think uh, Richard puts it out uh, very very kindly in the sense that it may be uh, mildly positive or marginally positive to, to 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 the market, but it may rest predominantly on on the fact that the uh, that the the, uh, the fleet factors uh, could uh, could play favorable into to that of the the freight rates uh, because because of the fact that those barrels are likely to find a short haul home, uh, and that is of course uh, the one thing that uh, that that limits uh, the uh, the extent of which we can see uh, long haul barrels, uh, which we uh, love the most in shipping. Um, we are getting quite a few questions in the in the Q and A about the longer term impacts of energy transition. Um, so I kind of want to move the conversation a little bit further out and, and the longer term view. Um, before we get there. Is, is a, does anyone have any sort of wild cars that might have the effect the next six months? It sounds like there are some green shoots with increased supply, hopefully a reco continued recovery of demand in, um, in, in the West. Um, it strikes me that it's, it's really down to, to vaccination rates and, and impact of variants, but I don't know if anyone has any, anything we've missed as we look to the, the second half of 2021. Uh, but this is tankers and anything can happen, right? You know, what do you want? Do you want a container ship wedged across the Suez Canal? Do you want, you know, some sort of tanker being bombed in the, the Texas, Persian Gulf? You know, any, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, anything can happen, right? And it always does in tankers. So you can never forget there will be those events which create a lot of volatility. But you've kind of hit the base case, you know, on the head. It's, you know, effectively we are seeing demand recovering. It's going to take time to get back to pre-pandemic levels, um, but everything's moving in the right direction. I'm not sure it can get much worse. I mean, that doesn't take much analytical power to predict that, but it looks like we are slowly moving in the right direction, but there's there's not, nothing to say that suddenly tomorrow we'll be back in profitable territory. Yeah. So one, one sorry, sorry but one thing we've not, we've not really talked about that much, we sort of alluded to, which is um, US crude exports. We you know we've, we've said, you know, from a tanker's point of view, it's what you want to see. And, and, and I think, probably worth just talking a little bit about about why we're not and why we're probably not about to for maybe for a little while which is which is shale right so you know pre-pandemic at these kind of prices you would expect to see um a lot of that revenue being pushed into capex more drilling more output uh, and we're not and, and, the, and the simple reason is is a lot of these uh companies are shoring up their you know their, their profit and loss and they're, they're pushing a lot more into paying down debt so we're not seeing a lot of capex, increasing capex, and new drilling happening. 
what we're seeing though is we you know we are going to see we are expecting to see some increase in output from the us this year but that's mainly from the you know the drilled but uncompleted wells which of which there are a lot so you know long term i you know i think there's a lot of talk about the death of shale i think that's massively overstated but you know the huge investment that went into you know export infrastructure in the us gulf which is massively underutilized is still going to be underutilized for a little while longer um, I think, you know, we're going to start seeing increases towards this year. I think we're talking, um, you know, 400 to 500,000 barrels a day, additional billion this year, and then rising again. But, um, you know, it, it is, there's, that is not going to be, it's unlikely to be a positive wild card, if you see, if you see what I'm saying. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> this question is directed to you, Peter. It says, Peter, you've been, this is from Richard Diamond, you've consistently been negative on every segment of shipping since I've heard you speak at the conference in London in September 2019. Is there any, is there any class of shipping you would buy today? And perhaps that is a nice segue to talk about what's going on in the container market and how that might actually affect fleet development, um, which, you know, for, which is probably a, bit, a bullish signal for the tanker market, at least over the next um, couple of years. Can you, can you talk to that? Well, first of, all, I, first of all, I'm flattered that someone remembered what I what I said two years ago. That's a, that's extraordinary in itself. Uh, but uh, but in, in many ways, um, uh, making uh, making use of that uh, bearishness in a in a positive way. Uh, take uh, take uh, the most hated uh, tanker sector at the moment now and, and put your money where that is, uh, because that is uh, that is perhaps uh, the, the the best the best buy you will make in in the market right now. Uh, going back to uh, to to the uh, the middle of the past de decade, um, I was um, I was in in Singapore talking about the, the container shipping sector, and at that point in time, the Panamaxes were, well, just walking uh, stranded assets. Uh, I guess is a, is, a, is, a, is a term nowadays. Uh, and uh, and if you bought one of those at that point in time, that would have been uh, well, your pension funds uh, in heaven and, and then some. Uh, but uh, but going forward uh, and talking about the oil demand and, and uh, the uh, questions coming in, I think we are very much in the safe house in terms of oil demand uh, for for uh, for at least 2025, and also for 2030 to some extent. Uh, recall that uh, the um, uh, the pledges made by President Xi of China is that uh, they are going to peak uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, by 2030 unlikely to be happening before that. Of course, it's not oil emissions, all of it. It also relates heavily on, on that of coal, of course. Uh, but uh, but it, it, it remains a fact that, that China is likely to, 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 to fight carbon emissions, mostly on, on the coal side and not so much on the oil side. So uh, so looking at also the uh, not only the, um, the medium term, but, uh, but the, the longer term, uh, I would not be afraid that uh, that oil demand all of a sudden evaporates uh, beneath our uh, feet. That whole say climate agenda needs time to to uh, to to get into uh, into the gears uh, to to put that transition uh, thoroughly on the rails, and we are still very far away from that. I think mostly what we see in terms of renewables, of course, taking up some of that uh, uh, fundamental demand for for energy on a global scale is merely biting into the chunk of uh, growing demand, not so much into established demand already. So, so uh, I know that uh, I don't think I've, I've been a, a, one of the, 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 the bears for, 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 oil, or for oil demand in, in, in the past uh, a lot, uh, mostly been uh, into, uh, into the area of, of the ring where I have seen a huge demand for energy, actually putting somewhat of a cushion uh, for, uh, for for shipping uh, and, and shipping of fossil fuels uh, going forward, at least, as I said, into to 2030, uh, coal being perhaps the one exception, but, uh, but, uh, but also LNG seems to be in a sweet spot, at least until 2030. And, and it originates from the fact that, that global energy demand is still very much on the rise mm -hmm. and, and any electricity uh, transition is, uh, is, is, is unlikely to, to uh, eat into that of oil demand. It's more likely to eat into to that of coal demand, basically due to, to the way that energy uh, demand and, and, and production is structured today. Uh, but if so, you might, so, yeah, please. Uh, I guess the, the, you know, in a more concrete short-term view, it might impact fleet development in a positive way for rates, at least, in the sense that these are 15-year assets, 
you know, you're talking about 2030, that's only, you know, it's an eight and a half years away. Um, so are people going to be investing in these in, in, in a fleet now uh, with these concerns over long term uh, demand uh, for the ships themselves? And secondly, you are bullish on the well, the container markets is doing extraordinarily well and shipyards across the world are filled with orders for new container ships. Um, oh, so the argument, therefore, is that actually we might see rates supported by a lack of new fleet development, you know, over the, in the next um, at least in, you know, uh, until 2023. Um, Richard, can you can you it, it, does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean. It's, it's absolutely okay. I mean, we're loving the fact, you know, we're very much exposed to tankers, our company. So we're loving the fact that everyone in the container market and the LNG market is plowing in and looking to invest in new tonnage because they're taking all the shipyard slots away from the tanker market. So, yeah, we're looking very much forward to really sort of 2023, 2024. Um, we've still got quite a lot of vessels delivering next year. So I think there's something like 55 VLCCs due for delivery next year and quite a large number of other vessel classes as well. So fleet growth will continue next year, unless we have something exceptional on the scrapping side, which at the moment is not looking hugely likely, although we're still very optimistic that will eventually come. But there's very few tankers for delivery in 2024, and it's pretty low for 2023 as well. So if we fast forward a couple of years, we get to say end of 2023, 2024, we've got world oil demand back above pre-pandemic levels, suddenly we've got no new tankers coming out. Those vessels that should have been scrapped this year haven't been scrapped, will eventually have to be scrapped. They've only probably got another two and a half years tops left in them. So suddenly you'll have a much tighter fleet supply position and you'll have stronger demand. So there's a bright outlook for the tanker market. It's probably going to take us another 18 months to really get to that bright outlook, um, but it is coming. But the key thing with this market is nothing lasts forever. And we know that if we have a boom in the market, you normally only get that for two or three years. And then like the container sector, we'll go and um, sow the seeds of our own destruction by building lots of new ships. Mm. Uh, John Ogden in the, in the chat asks, you know, you, and you just mentioned it there, that there is still, what I think you said, 55 ships coming into the fleet in the next, uh, in next year or so. Is that only going to, in his words, uh, rub salt into the wounds of... Uh, of the market in the short term yeah potentially i mean you know again if you look at those 55 vlccs as we talked about earlier those vessels are probably going to do clean products on their first voyage so that's going to take away some clean product tanker demand um, during the first few months of their lives and then of course they'll come into the crude market um, soon after that and again continually add supply um, add to the supply side story we're probably not going to see that same amount of vessels taken out of the market next year. So it's going to take a few years for the supply demand balance to fully redress. In our view next year, we think that tanker owners on average will probably be around about break even levels. It'll probably take until 2023 before they start um, generating some decent income once again. Mm. Uh, and beyond that, um, one bullish note, especially on, I guess, the product side of things on the clean tank side is, um, you've got this development of these mega refineries in the, in the Mideast. That typically means more ton miles, you know, as a, as a um, compared to the hist historical refining complex. Matt, do you think that's a, a bullish signal for the, uh, the future of, of at least the, 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 the product side of things? Yeah, I, I think it really depends. So, so one of the questions sort of alluded to what's, the, you know, what are the long-term prospects for product, you know, oil demand? And I think, you know, one of the issues that we had we, we had we thought we had a clear picture pre-covid you know mature economies were on the decline but um emerging economies were were making up for that and and so maybe peak demand was the mid 2030s um somewhere around there so covid's kind of thrown a spanner in the works there because now um you know a lot of the emerging economies will once we've sort of recovered some of the losses we'll continue on the decline and and the energy transition will accelerate if anything um the emerging economies, some of them haven't, they haven't benefited from the fiscal stimulus that, that developed economies have had during COVID. And so their ability to, to continue to grow their economies is maybe somewhat stunted. And so we're, we're in a position now where we, we don't know how the uh, oil demand is going to progress among the countries in which it is the most relevant from an oil demand perspective. Um, I talked about Southeast Asia earlier, and I think that's, a, you know, they are a key area for future um, 
for future refiners to look to and target for, for exports, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, et cetera. Um, you know, that is, that is a big question mark. I think, you know, we had, you know, there's, there's, there's been rationalization in Australia, which is obviously a good ton mile voyage. So I think, you know, those refiners would do well to, to ship out to, to there. Um, but, but I think the question will really be how are, you know, African and, and Southeast Asian economies going to, going to bounce out of COVID um, and, and the next six months to a year will be, will be very telling. Yeah, and, and I think it's a fascinating point that you raise, which is all of this discussion is largely predicated on the idea that COVID has ultimately no long lasting impacts, especially on the trajectory of energy transition. Um, you know, and, and uh, are we going to see a, a more rapid shift to change in, um, in hydrocarbon consumption? Um, you know, one thing that you said prior to this actual um, e event, Matt, to me was that, you know, energy transition probably is, is going to do more to change the type of tanker that's ordered necessarily than the, 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 um, the, the tanker market itself. Um, how do you see energy transition changing the, the nature of the tanker market? I mean, perhaps, perhaps Matt, you can kick us off on that. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's definitely up for debate. I think the, the shift, I think that one of the main factors is, is the shift in refining capacity east, for sure. Um, you're, you're bringing refiners closer to the sources of demand, right? So, you know, it's becoming in some ways a bigger MR market, particularly with, you know, previ prior to recent events, huge amount of product coming out of China, um, which was serving, serving the region. Um, you know, not to go off on a tangent, but, but it really does look like, you know, Chinese product exports are, are going to be on the decline for a little while anyway. Um, we, we're, we're, like, we're expecting to see export quotas slashed quite significantly this year. There's talks of um, them maybe only reaching, you know, uh, 40 million tonnes, which is uh, nearly 20, 20 million tonnes less, le less than last year. And based on that, we're already past halfway for the year. So they, we're going to see less this year. And, you know, whether that's around the Chinese government's ambitions around the energy transition or their wish to control the independence, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, that's a significant event because China now didn't really ever plan on becoming a, a product exporter. They wanted to be self-sufficient. They just invested very heavily and independence went wild. And now they are um, a huge or they have been a huge product exporter in the region which has been serve it, serving the regions, serving, you know, Southeast Asia. So, you know, that, that was a good MR market. You know, now, where are these uh, developing economies going to be sourcing the incremental barrel from? Middle East, most likely, which is, which is definitely good for ton miles. Mm. Um, Peter, um, another macro question for you, but talking, staying on that theme of energy transition, an impact on the tanker fleet. There's a, a question in the chat from Carl Jeffrey who asked, do you think CO2 shipping uh, market could be of interest to the tanker operators one day? Um, what's your, your take on that and more broadly energy transitions impact on the market? Um, I don't think uh, shipment of, uh, of CO2 will make a, a huge impact on, uh, on the tanker markets. I trust that any uh, any uh, significant impact on, on climate change, you need to uh, to capture the uh, CO2 at, at, at the origin source. Uh, so, uh, so so very limited uh, tankers are likely to, uh, to to get employed by that. But having said that, I mean, uh, those uh, those first movers that we see already setting something up, transporting uh, CO2 from, uh, from the northern part of Europe to, uh, to Iceland uh, is, of course, uh, perhaps uh, an omen of what may come. Uh, but I don't see that as a as a as a big play uh, going forward. Uh, but uh, but surely, uh, when uh, when looking at uh, the energy transition and, and that of uh, transportation, which of course takes up a huge part of uh, the uh, the oil demand, that is of course uh, tricky in terms of uh, passenger uh, vehicles, much more than it is for uh, for for trucking and and long haul trucking in in particular that relies on on distillates uh, other than, uh, than 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 gasoline. So uh, so what we see in terms of uh, of uh, the shift to, to electric vehicles uh, on, on a global scale. It is still very slow, at least in, in, in the way that we see it, even though you, uh, you can paint quite bullish pictures on, on the uptake of, um, 
of, uh, of uh, EV sales on a global scale, you always need to put that into perspective of, uh, of the present fleet of, uh, of, uh, of passenger cars and, and trucks uh, on, on the global scale. You may see sales grow uh, quite significantly over the next uh, decade or so, uh, but there's still a massive fleet that needs to, uh, to, to exit also uh, the, uh, uh, the passenger uh, transportation sector in order really uh, to, to bite into uh, to that. Uh, fundamental level of demand uh, and basically uh, get that into reverse, uh, impacting tankers uh, significantly when that happens and most likely uh, beyond 2030. Yeah, I know we're starting to wrap up here, but um, to you, Richard, one of the things that certainly is part of a broader ESG initiative globally, but certainly on the, on the, uh, in the West, is going to be responsibility around um, scrapping older vessels and regulation and, and so forth around that. As those um, restrictions or those, those, um, those policies increase the costs uh, incurred by, uh, by, the, by, by ship owners, what, what does that happen? What does that, how does that impact the tanker market? What do you see with the fleet? Does it just continue to age or? No, I'm, I'm not so sure it has, a, it has a huge impact. I mean, you'll see many of the European uh, tanker owners tend to divest their assets at a younger age um, where they can still be sold for, for further trading. So I'm not sure it has a huge impact on that. And there's some some owners as well who will just anyway um, just sell the vessels and not worry about it too much. But we have seen a few cases where some companies have been uh, dragged through the mud a little bit for their scrapping activity. And hence now where they tend to get rid of their assets at a younger age. But it's more about the European owners in particular and more now trying to lead the agenda when it comes to investing in the next generation of tankers. And the big question right now is what should be fueling that ship? Um, mm. Should you still go for a conventional tanker burning oil-based fuels, but look for the most efficient vessel possible, possible? Or should you go for something burning, perhaps ammonia, or even further down the line, hydrogen? The answer right now, um, clearly the industry doesn't know. Many owners are trying to adopt a flexible approach whereby they order an ammonia-ready tanker, an LNG-ready tanker, or even an LNG-powered tanker. Um, but at the moment, there's still no clear consensus on what the best path is forwards. But clearly, some owners, certainly from an ESG perspective now, want to be seen to be investing in the greenest ves vessel possible or available to them right now. We'll see more of that trend continuing. And then finally, I guess a question, a good question to end on uh, to you, Matt, of Kepler. Um, Petros in the chat asks, what is the current position of the tanker shipping cycle? Um, I, I think over the last year, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to know. I mean, we're definitely on a recovery. It, you know, the, 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 supply si the supply signals and demand signals are positive. Um, like Richard said, it can't get much worse. Um, we're, we're definitely, we should be through the worst unless, unless there is a sudden, a sudden reversal or a spike in COVID that sends demand in the, the wrong direction and or OPEC fall out again. But actually, if OPEC fall out again, it might be a great thing for tankers. Um, you know, we are we're at the bottom and, and, and the only way is up. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating, uh, the, our audience and then also our panelists. Um, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, Matt Wright of, uh, of Kepler, Richard Matthews of Gibson and Peter Sound of BIMCO. Um, back to you, Nick. Thank you, Paul. And thank you again to Matt, Peter and Richard. Uh, that was a really fascinating discussion. Um, from everyone at Reuters and our partners for this webinar, Kepler, uh, thank you for listening and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.